and welcome to a very special episode of Frankly Speaking. And tonight uh, I have a man who's known as an economist, is a better historian, uh, if one can say that, than an economist. Uh, but as an economist, he's uh, uh, an economist par excellence. Uh, joining me tonight is uh, Sanjeev Sanyal. Uh, I don't know what to call you. Historian, economist on the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. Uh, how many hats have you worn? Well, I have uh, started life as a financial markets uh, economist. Now I'm a policymaker economist. I also have a side business in writing. Some of those books are history books, but I have written uh, fiction as well. And, and in the past, uh, a special analyst uh, on the budget shows of Times Now as well. And I remember you in that hat when you were a, a financial markets expert. But a new book. Uh, revolutionaries and uh, Sanjeev Sanal, it's an attempt to look at history, a skewed version of which has been presented to us in our country. Uh, you call some of these revolutionaries who've played a role in the Indian freedom movement uh, as the nationalists and labeled uh, some of those uh, who have been earlier. Uh, uh, you know, mentioned as the greats in history, as the loyalists. Why do you make that distinction? So, um, for the viewers, so that I explain what this is, the book is called Revolutionaries, the other story of how India won its freedom. Now, what has happened here is that a particular narrative of Indian history has been given to us, which is skewed, in that it gives the impression that India's freedom struggle was somehow uniquely um, nonviolent. Now, of course, the nonviolent movement does have a role. But there is an armed resistance that was also very, very important. And many of these characters, uh, going back to Sri Aurobindo, Savarkar, then, of course, through Rash Bihari Bose, Sachin Sanyal, uh, the likes of Bhagat Singh, Chandrasekhar Azad, Bismil, all the way through to uh, Netaji, and then finally the, the, the revolt of 1946. Throughout this sort of narrative, uh, you, the storyline, first of all, leaves much of them out, many of the most of them out. But even if you did know about these individual characters, you get the impression that they are sort of individual acts of heroism. Whereas, in fact, they were a part of a very well-organized uh, movement that lasted over five decades and had its origins even earlier in armed resistance of an even earlier era. So the reason I wanted to write this book is that it is important to bring these people out to show that this is not just random acts of heroism, that there was a plan, there was an ideology. These people had massive linkages around the world. Uh, if in the First World War, they had an embassy in uh, Istanbul and in Berlin. In the Second World War, of course, in Tokyo and Singapore, they had, they, they, they had a government, the uh, the. Um, the Azad Hind uh, Forge oh. as an army. So these, these are not trivial groups of people with small, uh, uh, you know, uh, efforts. These were huge efforts. And in that, now to come to your question, you have here uh, a, a schism in, uh, that is, uh, why not call them by the name by which the revolutionaries call these people? So they call themselves the nationalists, and they call the other side, the loyalists, and by the way, these terms are not mine. They are the terms used by Sri Aurobindo back in the 1900s. So, so Sanjeev J uh, Sanyal, because I'm also a student of uh, political history, if I understand you, you are trying to say that Gandhi, Nehru, and the Congress are not the only people who got this country its uh, freedom, its independence. There were a whole lot of others, extremists, the Lal, Bal, Pal uh, trio that we talk about, were equally, uh, you can say, the authors of the independence that we got. Is that the attempt? Absolutely. There is a wider uh, range of our society that participated in this. Much of this was through the armed revolt. And by the way, the revolutionaries had all kinds of other links as well. They were linked to the Eka movement which is a peasant movement. They are linked to tribal revolts, like that of um, uh, Sitara Maya Raju in uh, Andhra Pradesh. And the movie RRR is broadly based on that uh, effort. So there were many other things that were going on. And the revolutionaries were at the heart of this other effort. Even within the Congress, by the way, they were quite powerful. Lal Bal Pal, after all, were within the Congress. 
Um, even in the 1930s, as Netaji demonstrated, the revolutionary uh, sort of stream was capable of winning elections within the Congress against the Gandhian faction. So even within the Congress, they, this group was very powerful. So to have simply edited them out of the story is, in my view, unfair. Uh, why then that a certain version of history has been propounded for just so long? Uh, were these stories not present or was there a deliberate move to somehow uh, give the Gandhian, the non-violent part of our uh, independence movement, uh, a greater traction, a greater uh, uh, so-called, uh, you know, presence in our history books uh, than the other part. Because Lal Bal Pal, as uh, we talk about, are uh, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Lala Lajpat uh, Rai, and uh, Bipin Chandra Pal, and all of them clearly were from, if if you can call it that, the extremist part of the Congress. Was there a deliberate move to do this by? even the historians who were part of the loyalist camp? I would argue so, but it didn't happen before independence. In fact, it didn't even happen in uh, Mahatma Gandhi's own lifetime. This is actually a real shift that happens uh, in the 1950s. So if you look at the conversations about freedom that were happening even in the late 40s or early 50s, they're very different. Um, you have historians like R.C. Majumdar telling a very different story of India's uh, freedom struggle in which the revolutionary movement does have a very large role. Uh, you have Ambedkar, you know, very famously in his uh, um, uh, interview with BBC, mentions clearly that, uh, at least in his view, um, it was the INA and Netaji that were the trigger to India's freedom. So these other narratives were there till the early 50s. Unfortunately, what happens is that in the 50s, one stream of the Congress party essentially takes over all power. And this happens because the revolutionaries, for all their um, energy and effort that they had put into getting independence, they did not have much of a leadership after independence. Most of their top leaders had either been killed, hanged, or had in some cases died of natural causes as well. So they were essentially leaderless and therefore divided. And they didn't actually get very much of a role in post-independence India. So it's not perhaps not surprising that those who did capture power wanted to uh, overplay their own role. Uh, that, at some level, is a human uh, tendency. Uh, tendency. But I think what is unfair is that they then systematically undermined the other narratives of India's freedom struggle, systematically. And I, I would argue that this was uh, quite deliberate. One of the interesting things, however, is that the revolutionary themselves were afraid that this is what would happen. So in his very famous book, Bandi Jeevan, which means life in captivity of Sachinrath Sanyal, in the very preface he writes that I'm writing this book in the hope that future generations will know uh, the truth about our movement. So e even those who, who were going through it were aware that this was a possibility. Because remember, they had a very high attrition rate. So they were involved in armed struggle, so they were being continuously sent to the gallows or sent to Kalapani from where they wouldn't return, uh, or they were sent into exile and so on. So <clears throat> the revolutionaries themselves have left actually quite a lot of material for us because they were afraid that this is exactly what would happen to them. Uh, we'll come to the Kalapani and uh, uh, you know the history surrounding uh, that, but uh, it's also important to understand the origins of the Indian National Congress. Of course, it did play a critical role in our independence, but it was originally conceived, as you write, a safety valve by A. O. Hume, among others, uh, and some would say weakened the nationalist fervor and anti-British sentiment in the country in the initial decades after the revolt of 1857. Uh, tell us a little more about that. So this is actually widely known. It's not something I have invented uh, or discovered. Um, many, many historians have pointed this out, that the Congress was actually set up by the British. And the idea was that it would be a safety valve, because do remember that this is just a couple of decades after the uh, Great Revolt. And so they were always afraid that you know this, this large populous country would rise in revolt. So what they did is they created this organization called the Indian National Congress, and they filled it with people who were, frankly, loyalists. So if you read some of the original debates in the Congress for the first couple of decades of its existence, they're actually quite painful to read, 
because they you know first if even if you made some minor uh, sort of point that uh, the speaker is trying to make they'll come with a long uh, sort of preface on how they are loyal to the uh, to the the crown and then make some very small uh, uh, demand this goes on to essentially the turn of the century when as you said the lal bal pal trio turn up incidentally there was another person in oh, there were, it was actually four people because there was another person and that was a gentleman called shri Aur, uh, uh, aurobindo ghosh now remembered as the sage shri aurobindo but he was actually in some ways the intellectual father of the revolutionary movement as it started so he is the one who gave the intellectual framework under which something called the anushilan samiti which was a network of akhadas by the way originally and that became ultimately the the sort of the backbone of this revolutionary effort uh, uh, you you talk about the anushilan samitis and the network of akhadas uh, but uh, i i want to ask you we we are a secular state but our revolutionary independence movement is steeped in some amount of religious symbolism as well that part is often glossed over because uh, the anushalam samitis uh, uh, which were uh, you know aurobindo ji had uh, initiated people into it people had a sword in one hand and the bhagavad gita in the other why is this not spoken about as much as uh, it could have been it's absolutely true uh, hindu revivalism was a very important part of much of what was going on in the late 19th century early 20th century uh, quite apart from the freedom movement there were uh, um, uh, sort of important uh, leader uh, 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 cultural and religious leaders like swami vivekananda for example uh, who were kind of reviving hinduism and re uh, sort of modernizing it so this is the context in which this happened many of the revolutionaries were uh, very strong uh, shakta hindus i e they were devi worshiping hindus many of these um, initiation rites were done in front of some version of uh, 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 adi shakti whether it's durga or kali or bhavani um, the the vande mataram uh, of course the first two stanzas are a national song but if you read the rest of it has a lot of uh, shakta uh, imagery uh, using durga and so on so Uh, the idea of bharat mata or uh, bhavani bharti becomes a very important part of the imagery of 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 these uh, revolutionaries now this is not to suggest that they were uh, bigots uh, there were many non hindus as well who were part of this uh, movement uh, there was ashwakulla khan uh, molvi barkatulla uh, bhika ji kama and so on so it's not that they were sort of narrow minded bigots but it is true uh, factually that um, uh sort of uh, uh, hindu symbolism particularly uh, devi symbolism is very important to the armed uh, resistance to the british but uh, you know the devi is durga bhavani kali that you talk about uh, uh, was also a manifestation of uh, uh, you know the warrior uh, kind of uh, uh, roop that uh, you Absolutely. can take yes. uh, and and it was also about valor uh, it wasn't was it really about religion or was it about the attributes of valor and attributes so of i don't think you can separate them you're talking about a period where um you are talking about a period where there is uh, an attempt to overthrow a, uh, a foreign force that's uh, occupying your country uh, there is a very strong sense of an ancient civilization as well and so all of these attributes of the civilization of this motherland get infused into the uh, imagery of uh, the devis so you have uh, you know ma bharati or bhavani bharati uh, being uh, repeatedly invoked so when you talked about the initiation rites there were many of these initiation rites would be done with a geeta in one hand a revolver in the other hand and two uh, kali or bhavani uh, so there is very much that um, and I don't know why should this is a this is a historical fact and there's no need to be um, embarrassed about it just because today uh, you know our constitution has the word secular in it and uh, with design uh, uh, many would say but uh, tell me how closely knit were these revolutionaries across the country uh, you had aurobindo ghosh and barin ghosh's uh, anushilan samitis you also had savarkar's mitra mandals or abhinav bharat all 
all working in some sort of uh, a concert with each other. How did that happen in times when uh, communication may not have been that easy uh, and the fact that the British were watching every move? So this is, uh, that is where this book, uh, I hope, will, uh, will be interesting because um, they were using the railways, they were using uh, many of the communication networks that the British had built. And of course, they weren't just doing this in India, they were doing this across the world. So, uh, for example, Savarkar had set up uh, uh, a, a unit in, um, in uh, India House in London. Uh, he had another group uh, functioning out of Paris. Uh, there were the Gatherites all along the west coast of North America. And inside India, as, as, you, as you said, there was Sri Aurobindo uh, setting up this network in Bengal. But do remember that when he started, he wasn't living in Bengal, he was living in Baroda. So there were all these amazing networks that were being built. And of course, the thing that they used to spread this uh, inside India was a network of akharas. Uh, these network of akharas, by the way, have existed in India from uh, medieval times. And they have a long history of resistance to um, foreign rule, again, forgotten very much. Uh, so this was used. And uh, internationally, students were used, but also, by the way, the network of Gurudwaras was used. So this was also a very important thing. So this network of Gurudwaras, the network of temples, the network of Akharas, these were what were being used to spread this um, nationalist um, you know, message. Um, also many revolutionaries going far and wide uh, uh, to Kabul, to Persia, people like Pandurang, uh, Kankoje and uh, people who collab collaborated with the uh, anti-British forces in, in these countries, in these parts of the world. Uh, how did they uh, keep in touch with the revolutionaries back home? So obviously it was not easy. And very often they would lose touch with each other. But let me give you an example of Pandurang Khangoji. He came from Nagpur, he escaped to Japan, then went to North America and was part of the Gadarite movement. In the First World War, he then gets backed by the uh, Turks and the Germans to try and invade India from the west uh, using an army through Persia. And so he ends up and he ties up with another revolutionary base there called uh, Sufi Amba Prasad. And they raise an army, uh, partly Indian, partly uh, local Persian tribesmen and so on. And they are trying to enter India through the west, through Balochistan. Interestingly, the person who was kind of sent to fight them off is uh, Brigadier Dyer who we remember from Jallianwala Bagh, but his original sort of reputation was built fighting Pandurang Khankoji uh, on the border of uh, what is now Iran and uh, Balochistan. So uh, General Dyer makes his name there and then comes uh, to Punjab and Jallianwala Bagh happens. And uh, at that time, there's also mention in your book about the fact that uh, uh, Akal Thakht actually presented him a siropa in Punjab after Jallianwala Bagh. How did that happen? So you have to understand the internal politics uh, of various groups. On one hand, you have uh, these uh, sort of revolutionary nationalists operating through <clears throat> Akharas, but also through the Gurudwaras. And you have on the other side, the uh, British intelligence, which knows that this is going on. And they're very afraid that these uh, 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 Sikh soldiers in the army, the Maratha soldiers in the army, and others are going to go into revolt in the middle of the First World War, not, a, not, not going to be a happy situation. So what they do is they begin to infiltrate uh, many of these institutions, particularly, for example, the Gurudwaras. So, for example, in North America, um, there is a secret agent called Hopkinson who then infiltrates uh, many of these Gurudwaras, and the British spend a lot of money trying to buy off uh, these Gurudwaras and deliberately create a schism between um, the Sikhs and the Hindu community, uh, which were very close and intertwined uh, up to that point. Now, that is the context in which you have to go back to Jallianwala Bagh. What is going on in 1919? These, soldier, these Indian soldiers who fought in the First World War had nearly revolted under the Gadar uprising in 1915. That uprising didn't quite happen, but they had nearly revolted. They had gone off to war. They had come back now. They are still radicalized. And they are now experienced soldiers who have lost the fear of killing the white man. 
So there is a genuine fear among the British authorities that these people are now going to revolt. This is the context in which the Rowlett Acts are imposed. And of course, it all spirals off in, and then culminates in the uh, uh, Jallianwala Bagh massacre. But at the same time, remember the British have invested in this network of collaborators, uh, which includes, by the way, certain members of the uh, Sikh community. So despite uh, Jallianwala Bagh massacre, just a few weeks later, Dyer turns up in the Golden Temple and he's given a siropa. And similar things happen in other parts as well. You see, for example, the, the Khalistan movement emerges out of Gurudwaras in Canada, which had originally been strongly uh, part of the Ghadar movement and were actually undermining the British Empire. So, Hopkinson. Ho Hopkinson was the man. And again, forgotten, there were gunfights in Gurudwaras, by the way, between the two factions in which people got killed. Um, very dramatic stuff that happened. And again, I, I was just surprised that there's so much material on this and you know, not many people talk about it. And nobody thought it was important enough to uh, write. Uh, Mr. Sanyal, Kala Pani. And, and this comes up even today in many contexts of the present day politics that we see. Kala Pani evokes uh, horror, not just uh, Savarkar, but Barin Ghosh, Ulaskar Dat, uh, Sachindra Nath Sanyal, uh, you know, all uh, belonging to the Gadar movement, all spend time in Kala Pani. What sets Kala Pani in the Andamans apart from the rest of the Kala Pani? I mean, and, and therefore, the importance of Savarkar. So, again, the uh, cellular jail in Port Blair was not just any old jail. It had been deliberately created to essentially break the, the revolutionary. So, if you hang people, they hang them. But then you take people who you, can, who you think you can really torture and break them. And so that's what Kala Pani was. And uh, life there was uh, really you know, terrible and, and so bad that many, many inmates uh, uh, committed suicide and so on. You had Ulaskar Dath who was repeatedly electrocuted and lost his mind. You know, it was, it was just a horrible, horrible place. I mean, uh, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's the British equivalent of Auschwitz. What the Nazis did in Auschwitz, this was basically what they were trying to do to us. Um, and so it has a certain evocative uh, sort of uh, image in the minds of those who had uh, came from this nationalist armed struggle. And of course, uh, uh, the likes of Savarkar were sent there. And this is not uh, like being sent to the luxury wing of Naini Jail. Uh, this is a completely different uh, ball game. And the revolutionaries are always trying to liberate this place. Even in the First World War, there was an attempt through uh, uh, by, funded by the, uh, the Germans to try and liberate it through uh, Thailand, uh, which didn't happen. But, and of course, in the Second World War, one of the first things that uh, Netaji does after he takes command of the uh, INA is to visit the Andamans, which was then under Japanese uh, control, and he visits the cellular jail. And he renames the two islands, which have been again renamed back to uh, what he had named them, um, Swatantra and Swaraj. So, this was a very important part of the imagery of the armed struggle. Uh, it is shocking that uh, we know the, these, uh, the cellular jail, rather than being converted into a national monument, was nearly torn down after independence. Uh, it, at the last minute, it was saved, and one part of it is still around to be a national monument. But I'm glad that there is now a uh, growing interest um, in this uh, lineage of our freedom struggle. Uh, and what, uh, how do you see statements that are made and letters by Savarkar that are written with uh, your obedient servant being called, uh, uh, called out as uh, Savarkar being totally, uh, you know, kowtowing to, to the British? How do you respond to that? So, of course, I mean, politically motivated rubbish. Um, no question about it. Everybody wrote... Uh, uh, your obedient servant um, in those days, uh, you can read pretty much anybody's letters and you, there's a particular courtly language that was expected to be used. Um, if you, you know, by the way, similar kind of language is still retained in our courts today. Uh, you know, you have to write a prayer to his, uh, his, lordship. his lordship. 
uh, it's not like you're actually worshipping him, but that's the courtly language that has somehow survived there. But of course, 100 years ago, that was the standard way of writing. Uh, and, you know, there is Jawaharlal Nehru writes a similar letter when he was uh, uh, imprisoned briefly in Nabha, for example. I think it was at Nabha. Uh, but, you know, so there are similar things. I mean, Sachindranath Sanyal um, wrote a similar letter. He was released in 1920. Uh, he then went back out. He formed the Hindustan Republican Association, recruited Bismil, Ashwakullah Khan, uh, Bhagat Singh, Chandrasekhar Azad and the likes. Now, if he hadn't written that letter, uh, you wouldn't have any of these characters who we all uh, agree were important parts of our freedom struggle. Uh, and the, the, you know, the Hindustan Republican Army would not have existed. So many of these people were uh, writing these letters routinely. By the way, Chan, uh, Sachin Sanyal was then sent back to Kalapani in 1926 or 27. He spent another decade uh, and ultimately culminating in the INA. So what I'm trying to say, these people were writing these letters. They were going back to doing things they wanted to do. And uh, as far as Savarkar is concerned, uh, Savarkar was uh, obviously not a trivial person since he not only spent many, many years in uh, Kalapani, even after he was released, he was kept uh, in virtual uh, house arrest in uh, Ratnagiri. And he was a very important part of the conversation. You see the likes of Bhagat Singh reprinting his books uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, he, he, he was clearly considered an important character even later, even though he left the uh, revolutionary movement. Uh, he was still considered an inspirational character even later on. Sanjeev Sanyal, I want to ask you a frank question. How united was the freedom struggle after the Khilafat movement and the Mopla riots? The first left many disillusioned, the second left, uh, uh, you know, it was so brutal in terms of uh, the atrocities that were heaped on Hindus. Uh, was there any unity? Uh, how did our freedom struggle suffer after these two incidents? So I think uh, this is uh, something we need to talk about uh, honestly. Uh, suddenly, after Chauri Chaura, uh, Mahatma Gandhi withdrew the non-cooperation movement. This is also in the context, as you mentioned, the Mopla uh, riots happened. Lots of Hindus were uh, brutally massacred in it in Kerala. So many revolutionaries, who to start with were somewhat ambivalent about this entire non-violent approach, uh, but had nonetheless joined in, so to speak, um, were very disillusioned. And sort of they drifted back out, and that is the context in which the Hindustan Republican Association was created as a sort of revival of the, of the armed uh, resistance. But not everybody uh, went that way. Uh, you have, for example, um, some disillusioned uh, former revolutionaries decide that, look, um, any, any uh, such um, sort of uh, movement will get subverted by the politics of the time and something like the Khilafat, some compromise like the Khilafat will happen. And so that is the context in which in 1925 you have Hedge Varji uh, forming the RSS. Uh, also a derivative, by the way, of uh, the uh, Anushalan Samiti and the revolutionary movement. So the RSS comes out of it. One branch is the HRA, another branch is the RSS. And of course, there are the communists who emerge in the 1930s as well. So you're saying spiritual movement of Aurobindo ji actually uh, is where the roots of the RSS uh, were or really origins were. Uh, not many in today's context will even be ready to hear that version. Well, you don't have to. You just look at the evidence I provided in the book. Um, there is the revolutionaries, uh, uh, of course, started out with Aurobindo's ideas. Uh, he himself drifted off, by the way, in Pondicherry into a uh, somewhat more cultural, spiritual space. But his ideas then led, sparked off a whole bunch of groups, and the Anushilan Samiti itself then went into different directions. So, of course, there is one branch which remains, would remain the main mainstream branch of the revolutionaries through the HRA, ultimately culminating in uh, the INA and so on. Uh, then there are all these spin offs. So one of the spin-offs, by the way, is the Communist Party of, in, uh, of India, CPI, which was formed in Tashkent uh, by another revolutionary, M.N. Roy. Uh, later on, another split-off became the RSP, the Revolutionary Socialist Party, now almost forgotten party, but it was at some point a significant uh, presence. And then, of course, there is the RSS as well, um, which was set up by uh, uh, Hedgevar Ji, who was, by the way, the head of the Anishalan Samiti for Maharashtra, based out of Nagpur. Uh, and then he goes and set up the RSS. But again, if you want to know kind of like the design of the RSS, uh, 
Just go and read uh, Sri Aurobindo's Bhavani Mandir. It's an 18-page pamphlet. Just read it. Um, and you can clearly see where the inspiration for the RSS came from. So there are many branches to that movement. But the point is to say that there, are, that there is no influence would be ridiculous. I mean, any, anybody reading through that 18-page pamphlet can see uh, the influence of those ideas. Uh, let's let's talk a bit about Subhash Chandra Bose, Mr. Sanyal. The criticism against him is that he chose to collaborate with two extremely brutal regimes. Uh, one, the uh, German, the other, the autocratic Japanese, uh, um, you know, regimes. Uh, while he is undoubtedly an icon of the freedom movement, his strategy was misplaced and flawed is what many people say. How do you see this? Well, it depends on how you see the allies on the axis. Um, the Western narrative, which sometimes is imbibed here, is that the, the Second World War is a, a, a war between forces of good and evil. Um, the other way of thinking about it is quite different, particularly from the Indian perspective. After all, the Allies were in occupation of India. Um, and um, you know we should uh, see uh, the likes of uh, uh, Netaji as the resistance, after all, in France. Uh, the resistance is seen uh, against the Nazis are seen as uh, fighting, uh, you know, having a fair um, uh, sort of a reason to fight against the Germans. This exact same thing was true of, uh, of Netaji. After all, Netaji didn't like Nazism. In fact, he writes in his own writings. That, and in fact, he went to Hitler and in fact made his case against racism. Uh, so it's not that he was in favor of it. but. To say that because he allied with them, he was also a uh, Nazi is crazy. Because after all, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt allied with Stalin. Uh, was Roosevelt a communist? Uh, should uh, you blame mm, uh, uh, the Americans uh, for all the Stalinist purges and the millions of people who died there? Nobody in their sane mind would do that. So why should you um, have that view of Netaji at all? Netaji clearly was uncomfortable with Nazism. Uh, but I think quite correctly, he saw the Second World War as a war between two sets of evil empires, which they were. Do remember that the British carried out um, a scorch earth policy in Bengal, from where Netaji comes from, um, during the Second World War, deliberately killing three million people. Three million Bengalis died in 1943 in the Great Bengal Famine. And it was man-made famine. So, you know, there is very little to distinguish from an Indian perspective, uh, particularly a Bengali perspective, between uh, Churchill and Hitler. So uh, Netaji, I think, took the call that, look, what I have, am here to do is to free my people from this entirely evil empire. And uh, he took his chances. And uh, how much did the role of the INA uh, and the coverage of the Red Fort trials of INA soldiers and eventually the naval mutiny compel the British to realize uh, that their days in India were numbered? Well, certainly was a very, very important uh, reason why we got our freedom. And to again appreciate that, you have to appreciate what the situation is after, 19, uh, uh, after uh, the Second World War ends. The Indian Army uh, was in occupation of large parts of the world because you, the, 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 uh, the British, Australian, and, uh, and Americans, they were all going home. They were getting demobilized, and they, these soldiers wanted to go back home to their families, to their jobs, and so on. And so much of the world uh, that had been, um, that had fallen in Allied control was actually occupied by British Indian soldiers, which this is true in Egypt. It was true in what is now Indonesia, southern Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Burma. The, all these areas, you know, a huge swath of the world is occupied by the British Indian Army. But the problem is, there are obviously freedom movements all over there. And many of them are, require actual brutal suppression. In Indonesia, there were massive uh, battles uh, between the Indonesian nationalists and the British Indian uh, forces. And many hundreds of Indian soldiers died for it. So you can imagine there was a lot of grumbling. Hello, why are we getting killed for some, you know, not even the British Empire. This is for the Dutch that we are dying. Why would we want to do that? So the British Indian Army was on the verge of mutiny. And if they had indeed revolted, it would have really messed things up. 
So this is the context in which the INA uh, trials happen. The British completely miscalculate about the impact it has on the, on the British Indian forces scattered everywhere. And then of course the naval revolt of 1946. So this is the context in which the British very quickly realize that this army is going to revolt on us. And uh, you know, we will completely lose control of the situation. And it's during in the middle of the naval revolt of 1946 that the cabinet com uh, committee on Indian independence is announced by Attlee. It's not a coincidence. But uh, people like Sardar Patel also thought that the naval mutineers uh... Uh, battles, for example, with Netaji uh, in the 1930s. And it is true that he did go to the uh, naval mutineers and disarm them. Um, giving them promises that they would be in fact forgiven and so on, but in fact that's not what happened. Uh, they were not taken back, not only were they not taken back into the Royal Indian Navy, and many of them were imprisoned and so on. Uh, even after independence, the, uh, these uh, naval uh, ratings who had rebelled were not taken into the uh, uh, Navy of uh, Free India as well. That's also true, by the way, of the INA. Uh, so uh, those who, if one of the tragedies of Indian history is that many of those who put up such an armed struggle against uh, British occupation, uh, whether the INA veterans, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Royal Indian Navy uh, rebels, um, variety, whole range of revolutionaries, very, very few of them were rewarded in any way after independence. Um, uh, uh, in fact, many of them lost their homes because of partition, because remember Bengal and Punjab are both hubs of revolutionary activity. So in the chaos of partition, um, forget getting rewarded for uh, having fought for Indian independence, many of them lost their homes. So that brings me back to the question, have many icons of our freedom movement uh, still not been recognized 75 years after independence? Question number one. And this attempt at relooking um, and, and re-deciphering our own history in, in a different light. Uh, is it just an attempt? Many critics could say that. It is, is it just an attempt to denigrate the contributions of Nehru and the Congress uh, and, and bring out other icons? So I think bringing out others should not be denigration. Uh, the non-violent movement did have a role. I say this in my book as well. But to then ignore the contributions of the others is unfair. I have, of course, this book is mostly about the revolutionaries. Um, and the good news is that many of these are now finally finding recognition. You, you have recently had... Um, Vic uh, Vikram Sampath writing a book uh, on absolutely, uh, the Absolutely. Or, for example, on Kartavya Path, now you have a statue of Netaji. Um, the insides of Victoria Memorial have been converted into the Biplovi Bharat Museum. Uh, you know, and so on. So there is some recognition happening, even in popular culture. You have, for example, RRR celebrates uh, uh, that as well. But you have seen others as well. This is, of course, about the revolutionary movement. But there were uh, other efforts uh, prior to that. Uh, for example, in Manipur, uh, in, in uh, circa 1890, uh, the last sort of revolt by an in, you know a traditional elite of any part of India what happened in Manipur, by the Manipuri nobility had revolted against the British. And the Manipuri royal family was then whisked away and to Kalapani. This is before the cellular jail was created. And just about a few months ago, um, the place where they were kept, which was called Mount Harriet, has been renamed as Mount Manipur. So in some ways, we are beginning to uh, rediscover this uh, history. Many other parts of the country have other histories that should be also in the Paika revolt uh, in, in Orissa. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the, the efforts by various uh, uh, tribal groups, uh, for example, Birsa Munda and so on. These are all finally being rediscovered and celebrated. And I think that's a very healthy thing. The purpose of this book is that to take it to the next level and show that these were not individual efforts of people who just got up one morning and decided to do something. There is a continuous narrative, uh, systematic thought about what, in fact, it was the revolutionaries who first came up with the idea of India as a, as a republic, uh, when the Congress was still thinking in terms of a dominion status. And, and we don't even talk about uh... Absolutely. Uh, something as important as that. Uh, Sanjeev Sanyal, uh, this is your uh, 
book number nine. Yes, book number nine. And uh, how do you manage to write so many books? And uh, well, it's slow because I have I have uh, obviously official duties as well. Uh, not to mention writing for the last few years, also writing the economic survey and other things that takes up time. So these How are slow. How many economic surveys have you? Uh, I participated in about five economic surveys. So okay, that so nine plus five. Uh, nine plus five, but obviously my output has slowed. This book took me eight years to get to the table. Uh, so it has, and the other books in the in the pipeline which are half How done. How many more? There are lots in my head. Some of them are half researched here and there. So it takes me some time to uh, to do this. I wish I could be faster, but this is this is about as fast as I think ha I can keep it so going. So eight years researching this book. Yes, about eight nine years. Yes, something like that. And uh, Sanjeev Sanal, do you think uh, we should also be uh, writing, you know, chronicles about some of the more recent events, for example, uh, the emergency, 1984, 2002. So th th there have been books about it. Uh, but my own uh, feeling is that uh, there is not enough uh, sort of variety of uh, uh, sort of literature on many of these things. Uh, even today, uh, there's a lot of uh, critique of mainstream uh, narratives, but alternative narratives are not put forward. So even there, there is a bit of a skew. But that is not just true of more recent times. But if you look at the full history going back even earlier periods, uh, and I've tried to sort of correct some of it in my earlier books uh, by bringing, uh, you know, for example, India's maritime past, uh, which was a subject of my book, The Ocean of Churn, mm -hmm. um, or other forms of uh, thinking about history. For example, you don't only have to think political history, you can think of India's history in geographical terms, which is a subject of a book called um, Land of Seven Rivers. So there are other ways of thinking about history. And of course, this is just history. There is other parts, aspects of national life or, 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 or uh, intellectual life that can, can explore, whether it's economics or uh, even fiction. I've written fiction as well. So what I'm trying to do is uh, provide uh, sort of hopefully an, uh, alternative. an alternative views of uh, things. Um, you know, um, read it and decide whether you, or the evidence I bring to the table is, uh, is uh, convincing or not. Do you think the alternate views and debates on these issues should also be part of school curriculum? Absolutely. And I have been arguing for a long time, so it's not a secret, that our school uh, textbooks uh, on history particularly, but also on the social studies, need to be changed. Um, so I've talked a lot about history. But you know, take, for example, even today at university, if you read the curriculums, they are, you would get the impression that the Soviet Union was still around. Uh, that 1991 didn't happen. Um, you know, I was at university uh, when uh, the 1991 reforms happened, and I understand at that point in time the textbooks were still talking about the greatness of uh, uh, you know five-year plans. Uh -huh. But I recently looked up the curriculums of many many universities, and I was shocked that it still has that general tone uh, as if 1991 was some sort of a something we had to do, uh, but it's a bad thing, and that you know we should somehow revert back to some old povertarian kind of uh, uh, thinking. So uh, I think Indian academia is uh, stuck in a particular time ideological time warp. Uh, it needs to break out of. Why is it still not happening? Well, uh, some part of it is momentum. But hopefully one, one thing that needs to be done is to first create the alternative narrative. So one problem I would argue is that even though the likes of, for example, Arun Shori began to question this narrative in the 80s, they did it more in the nature of critics. So it's only relatively recently that the, an alternative narrative is being provided. You see, a criticism does not replace a narrative or challenge a narrative. It may act, at most cause some doubts. Ultimately, a narrative requires another narrative in order to have a proper debate. And hopefully, for example, and that alternate narrative also has to be based on research material. Absolutely, that it is drawn out of. Absolutely, the writing and, has and, to be there. Uh, something that's been buried, uh, you know, now presented. Yes, yeah, uh, so you know, hopefully, uh, at least in the case of the revolutionaries, let's say, in with this book, 
debate will happen, a general acceptance will happen that yes, there is this. So supposing then that begins to find its way into school or university curriculums, there will be a wider acceptance that, uh, about this line of thought. I'm not saying that this is the only line of thought. It's perfectly fine to have different lines of thought, particularly at universities where debate should be an important part of uh, uh, the, the, the natural state of things. But what has sadly happened is that the, this capture by uh, the Marxists and the Nehruvians of our intellectual discourse, I would argue, is finally being properly challenged. Why, why was the so-called uh, right wing so slow in its attempt? in bringing out an alternative narrative? Well, so some part is because uh, they, were, they were deliberately suppressed. I mean, I don't know if you uh, are aware, the likes of, for example, R.C. Majumdar, who is perhaps the greatest modern historian uh, India has produced. Uh, he was originally given the job of writing the history of India's freedom struggle. And when he began to give a somewhat wider story rather than this rather linear story of one part of the Congress, uh, he was removed from that uh, job as editor of the official history. So some part of it, at least, was deliberate uh, suppression of alternative narratives. Now, that remains, to some extent, even today embedded within the, the academic system, because there is some time lapse that requires to happen. And as I said, you, can't, you have to have a well-researched, well-thought-out narrative to challenge an existing narrative. It's not... It's not so easy to do and should not be. You know, otherwise, you see, it's Anybody not... can come and overturn... Uh... Yes, otherwise there'll be randomness. You see, otherwise, uh, one kind of nonsense will be replaced by another kind of nonsense. So you do need to put in the intellectual effort, the research effort to, to look through, make a reasonable case. And presumably, over time, that gets accepted more generally. Well, uh, on that note, uh, Sanjeev Sanyal, we are uh, looking forward to more such... Uh alternate views because clearly the one feeling that uh, people have is that there is a skewed sense of history that we've been presented. What is the other side? Now people are getting exposed to it. Which part will they accept or not will be open to debate? But as I said, uh, and I always say, debate is the only way forward because you must have different ideas uh, you know, debating with each other and, uh, and a final version probably being the more acceptable version uh, for a large body of people. Thank you very much uh, for uh, actually contributing to that effort of building the alternate narrative. I wish you very, very uh, best for your uh, book, which has uh, some rave reviews uh, uh, from fellow historians uh, like uh, Vikram Sampath, Amish uh, Tripathi and Ashwin Sanghi. Uh, but let's hope, uh, you know, the public reads this and gets the alternate view that has been absent for so long. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Thank you for joining me on Frankly Speaking.